In this video, you will learn about the power of static digital images in diagnostic pathology. You will also learn that you can actually use the images from your phone to do diagnostics. Hi, I'm Alexander Zurev and I'm here to help you do better digital pathology. So if you are after stepping up your digital pathology game this year, be sure to click the bell below, subscribe and be notified every time I release a new video. This video is a podcast episode I recorded with a friend and a fellow veterinary pathologist, Dr. Kate Baker. Kate developed a diagnostic app. So let's listen to her full story. Today, my guest is Kate Baker. She is a clinical pathologist and she, we are both veterinary pathologists. She's a clinical veterinary pathologist. I'm an anatomic veterinary pathologist. So I look at tissue and there is a lot of tissue processing involved when I have to look at images. And Kate can look at images that are actually made uh, on the spot in the veterinary clinic. And Kate was already a guest on my podcast, so I'm going to link to everything we have and we talked about with Kate before. Um, but she developed an app, a digital telecytology app, Pocket Pathologist. So first of all, welcome, Kate. Thank you for joining me again. Thank you. I'm super excited to be back again. <laughs> yeah, and let's talk about this app before we dive sure. into like how it was made and all the nitty gritty stuff that I want to know on the digital pathology site. Tell me what it is. How did you come up with the idea? And let us share the screen with the app. Yeah, while you're pulling that up, I can kind of go into what it is, just the, the yes. general overview. So like you mentioned, Cytology is a modality, a, a sampling um, modality that veterinarians can perform in their clinic. So they take an aspirate, uh, a needle biopsy essentially into a mass or a lesion of some sort, and then they can spray the cells onto the slide and stain it right there in their clinic and look at it under their microscope. So for anybody who's listening that's not as familiar with the difference between cytology, which is what I just described, and histopathology, which is what Alex does as an anatomic pathologist, there's just not really any processing aside from staining in the clinic that has to be done. So it makes it a, a, a point of care kind of um, test mm -hmm. that can be done inside of the clinic. The traditional kind of workflow for veterinarians is they will want to sample a mass and then they will either look at the mass or, you know, the sample themselves in their clinic and try to make a decision about what they're seeing, or they'll send it, well, I should say, and, or, because sometimes I do both, they'll go ahead and send it to a clinical pathologist for expert review. And so the trouble in the past, I should say, um, the challenge has been uh, for veterinarians in some cases you know, there is an associated cost with sending mm -hmm. in those slides to a pathologist to review. And there's a huge amount of value to that because we are trained, we're, uh, we've spent years in residency, years doing nothing but this to know exactly what we're looking at, or at least to, to get as far as we can in that process, that thought process. So there's huge value in that. But sometimes veterinarians are just faced with situations where their owners don't have the financial resources to to do that step or maybe they totally need information. the case in poland where yeah. i used to practice and that was actually a reason i pulled out of veterinary practice because uh, you want to help the animals you have the knowledge mm -hmm. you have the resources but the owners cannot pay for that and mm -hmm. i don't know i couldn't reconcile that that was um, tough for me so i moved into pathology yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge challenge. You know, it's one that veterinarians are facing every day. Um, some more than others. You know, some veterinarians are located in resource resource rich areas where the pet owners do have discretionary income to afford those um, types of services. But e even if that's the case, there's still going to be situations where some owners don't, or they have to prioritize finances. It's just a reality of veterinary medicine. Aside from the affordability standpoint, there's also the efficiency and speed. So regardless of the, of the 
availability of finances, there are cases where we really need to know information quickly. So whether this is an emergency standpoint and we're looking at, does this animal have a septic abdomen, which is an infection, you know, for anybody listening uh, that doesn't know, this is like an, essentially an infection inside of the body. Um, and so we can get information about that. And like emergency case, there is no time to yeah. like yeah. wait for the diagnosis. Right. So having modalities that, Uh, give that ability to be efficient in that diagnostic process are highly valuable and very um, oftentimes, even if it's not an emergency situation, it's just a workflow standpoint. The veterinarian needs to kind of get the owner to the next step so that they can keep moving with whatever they're dealing with. So speed is never a bad thing. Of course, we want to maintain accuracy with speed, but um, being able to cut out that time period between sending glass slides in the mail, you know, that, that ship has kind of sailed. That's what digital pathology in general has given us is that ability to get real-time feedback very quickly. The difference with what I'm doing in this service is that it, it is, a, at least it, as it stands now, digital pathology scanners are just still quite expensive. They've been around they for a long time. Prohibitively yeah, they, expensive. Yeah for, uh, let's say, small business owners. It's right. a great solution for uh, big institutions, companies, uh, but both in human medicine and veterinary medicine. If mm -hmm. you're like sole entrepreneur, so to say, I don't know how very much that is in uh, human medicine, but in veterinary medicine, especially in rural areas, this is the normal thing. Right. And And you can't work or, or collaborate with a company that actually provides scanners mm -hmm. to yeah. veterinarians so they don't own them, but they can use them. How does that differ from what you have? Like, what's yeah. the what's the situation yeah. there? Yeah. So uh, I do contract read for actually several of these uh, digital scanning services and companies uh, as a contract pathologist. So I really love the digital pathology technology now that exists and these yeah <laughs> yeah i know i'm speaking your language uh i i love it it makes things i mean as a whole these scanning um these scanners you know these are benchtop scanners some are bigger than others you know size does play a role in these decisions that some of these veterinarians are dealing with because if you're a mobile veterinarian you don't have room for a scanner so there are some options that are smaller But, you know, there's there's pros and cons to all these things, you know, whether you're leasing out a scanner um, or outright purchasing one, I think leasing is probably more common, but there's still, mm -hmm. you know, a monthly cost associated with the, that. And then on top of that, the cost to the client per sample. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. We, you know, these things, this is cutting edge technology. It needs to be, you know, uh, like that comes with cost, but there's just yeah, and a, Then you have to like make a business decision. Okay, do I right. have enough of cases that will justify this investment? Exactly. And sometimes there is not enough cases, but There's you not. still want to provide the highest quality of care for your patients. Right. And right. I guess that's when your app comes in mm -hmm. by let you yeah. continue this yeah. thought. Yeah, so that's where I was seeing a problem with there was a there was a gap, um, and and I didn't come up with this idea. So just <laughs> off the bat, uh, you did not? static. No, no, I didn't. Static telecytology is something that's been established both in human medicine and in veterinary medicine. There have been articles written about it. What it is is basically in its simplest form, the veterinarian or veterinary technician, the person in the clinic, is looking at the slide on their microscope in their clinic, and then they're taking photos with their smartphone or their, or their microscope camera. But a lot of times it's with a smartphone. These smartphones are so powerful <laughs> um, and their camera abilities are great. And so, you know, if you're good at holding your phone to the ocular, then you can just do it that way. Um, or there are some cheap attachments or even some more robust ones like uh, our friends over at Scoped Micro, they have yes. this Awesome I'm link attachment. In the description below. Yeah, it's an Love attachment them. we both use. Yeah, yeah, and it helps stabilize the phone on the ocular, and so you can take photos of what you're seeing, focal areas. You know, um, I see cells over here. I'm worried about these cells, or maybe I have a particular question about this group of cells, or whatever, and send those via the app to the pathologist, which right now is me, but I plan to expand that over time. 
um, for review. And it's a lower cost option for some of the obvious reasons. One, I mean, you don't have to, there's no scanner involved. So it's, you're just using something that you already own, your phone. Um, if you decide to buy an adapter, then it's a really low cost option under a couple hundred dollars. And you've got um, a system that you can use to get a pathologist opinion on your cases. You know, you're not, you're not going to be scanning the entire slide, um, at least in the form that we have it right now, maybe in the future, I won't say too much, but at this point you are taking still images. So there has to be some um, consideration about what you're taking photos of. So usually it's mm -hmm. uh, somebody that, or it should be somebody that has some, you know, some um, experience with cytology. You do not have to be a pathologist. It's just, you know, you just can, an insert here. If yeah. you want to learn more about veterinary cytology, my guest here provides excellent <laughs> courses that are CE hours, everything that mm -hmm. you need for professional education. So yes, that's <laughs> right there. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, I do. And I, we're going to be mean, linking to it in the description as well. Thank you. Yes. I, I mean, that's where all this started for me. I, I started with providing continuing education courses for veterinarians aimed towards the GP and in some cases the veterinary technician that's wanting to learn more about cytology to help support that in-house review, not to, not to replace pathologists. I mean, we do not want to be replaced, but we understand the realities that it's just not feasible for every case to go out to a pathologist and so i want my goal and my not every is case to does need to go right. to a pathologist right. because the level of um, expertise in veterinary clinics especially if uh, the veterinarians are interested in that and are like putting effort into education there is like a lot of cases that they are confident in diagnosing mm -hmm. um, yeah. but there is always a certain amount of cases that you know you need this additional expertise you need somebody who's doing only this who was trained only to do that mm -hmm. and i hear i i hear from veterinarians quite often that they feel almost ashamed or embarrassed to not know what they're looking at they feel like there should be some level of understanding that they have and i just there is a huge breadth of experience and comfort level in cytology, just like any other area of veterinary medicine. If you really like surgery, you're probably going to learn more about surgery and practice it. Same can be said for cytology. The tricky thing with cytology is that a lot of schools um, don't really emphasize cytology. I'm not speaking for all of them, but from what I understand of the majority of the people that uh, I come in contact with, they just didn't have a lot of training in school in this particular area. And so they don't feel confident. So it is never wrong to submit all your cases to a pathologist if you're able to. But I mean, even ones that are obvious, you know, they say like, oh, mm -hmm. I sent this in and it was a mast cell tumor and I'm embarrassed because I should have known that. No, you know, there are, there are people that are really good at cytology in practice and they still submit everything because they want a pathologist's name on that report just for you know, covering their bases and legality purposes. So mm -hmm. never wrong, never wrong. But this just provides a way for those veterinarians that need a service like this, whether it be because of finances, whether it be because of remoteness. I have a couple of clinics in Alaska and one in the Yukon in Canada that oh, use this. Yeah, awesome. yeah. It's, that's been one of the really cool things is seeing the different... Um, I had a, a, a vet from Indonesia send me a case last week and a couple from Australia. So these like remote areas where mail-in is not so possible, cool. you know, because of their remoteness, this is really, it's providing a solution to them, which is making me very happy. <laughs> That's what I want. So, so we just need a phone. Uh, if we want uh, an adapter to put on the microscope and okay. then we download the app, right? Mm -hmm. Pocket yep, Pathologist. Let's look here on the screen. Yeah, so this um, is the website, the um, the main page of the website, which you don't ever have to even go to the website. Yeah. Uh, you can just download it straight because onto your phone from the, uh, the App Store or Android, uh, Google Play. Mm -hmm. But so I, I did that before our call. I already am, um, even though I'm not practicing veterinary medicine in the classical veterinary medicine um I'm doing research. I do drug development support for my day job, but I registered so that uh, I could show you. So let's go to this pocket pathologist and let's see yeah, like so how is, does that work? I have it yeah. on the phone. I mm -hmm. took my picture. What do I do next? 
Yeah, so the screen you were just on is the main page. And then when you download the app, it'll look like this either on your phone or you can use it in your desktop. So this is the actual interactive app here on the desktop that we're looking at. And I mean for this to be super user friendly. Like that's my biggest, I know how busy veterinarians are. They don't have time to be, you know, poking around trying to figure out where things are. So right there in the middle, you're mm -hmm. right there at the top, submit your case. So if you want to click that, then what you do is here is just like, um, you know, any other submission form. But again, I spent a lot of time trying to make sure that I was only asking for information I really needed because mm -hmm. who has time to fill out a bunch of forms, you know, like super long forms that have stuff that you don't need. So patient okay, so information put, here. Us, we already are kind of in the system if we are just for the app, right? Right, right. Yeah. And this and may then, change just a um, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit too, is just because I know we're going to talk a little bit about how we develop the app, but this registration process may change just a little bit, again, with everything in mind to make things easier for the vet. So if you're tuning in and it looks a little different, um, it may look a little different in the future. It you, will tell us what to put right. in, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everything okay, will be really so easy. Reading yeah. is the only technical requirement. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Anybody can put the information in. I mean, anybody okay. in your clinic that is. And then you scroll down and you see there at the bottom, it says add site. And I'm, mm -hmm. I think it should let you, yeah. So then you put in the location, description of the lesion, and then there's where you put your photos in. So you can either put photos okay, or you so can put- Okay, so here is the photos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, and you can either do photos or short video clips. So if you prefer to just kind of video as you're moving around, you can do that too. Okay. Um, and then you submit, um, you can add multiple sites. There's a little discount if you add two sites for uh, one animal. So at this time, one site is 47 US dollars, and then a second site on that same patient is 37 US dollars. Mm -hmm. So we picked that price to kind of um, be affordable, but still, you know, obviously value our time as pathologists and our expertise, but to, to provide a, um, that support that isn't, uh, that makes it within reach and accessible for more, more pet owners, honestly. Okay. Um, yeah. That and so then sense. once you complete that, which it won't let you do because um, there's required fields, but that's okay because yeah. there you see it'll just take you to a payment screen and then you just put your payment in and then it goes to me. And then on my end of things, it pops up on my list and I look at it, uh, evaluate the pictures. One of the really cool things about this that I love is that I can communicate with the veterinarian or the veterinary technician, whoever's submitting the case directly through a chat feature. So mm -hmm. if I look at the photos and think, I really could use a couple more at lower objective or, um, you know, for whatever reason, I need something different. Um, I can give them tips directly through the chat okay. feature and it pops up as an alert on their phone. So they have their phone all mm -hmm. the time. So they see it pretty much immediately and then they can respond quickly. So it keeps things moving really nicely. This is fantastic. So yeah, yeah. I want to ask you how, so you do not have computer science background any, right? No. <laughs> no. Neither do I. We're veterinarians by training. Right. <laughs> but so you worked with a developer, app developer team. Mm -hmm. uh, this is like, this is something in digital pathology that fascinates me. How did you build the bridge between your developers team to build the app that is, yeah. you know, user friendly? How much did you need to learn from the app development computer science uh, side? And how much did you have to teach uh, your developers um, to have you know a good communication and yeah. a good product in the end tell me about this process yeah so i started this i i started this service without really think ever thinking about an app i didn't know what it was going to necessarily end up as so mm -hmm. the service itself started in whatsapp so i essentially beta tested this kind of unintentionally okay. through whatsapp where it was the same type of service but you can submit photos and then I would write back. There was no formal report at that time. There is now, but at the time it was just a conversation essentially. So it was a little out of the uh, norm of what people are used to, but it was really helpful because they could say, okay, I spoke with the pathologist and you know, this is what they said. Um, and then we would send a manual invoice. It was all very manual and it was mm -hmm. time consuming. So I realized, you know, people are using this, they need this service. And so how can I make this easier on both us from the admin standpoint and then on them as well. So 
you know, I was talking with a friend and she said, have you thought about an app? And I thought, well, I mean, that sounds great, but I think apps are a million dollars. And how do I even, who, who, like, do I just Google like app person? I mean, I don't even know. So she actually had a friend started, had a tech background and had started the company developing apps locally, which was kind of cool too. Um, And so we connected and uh, they were a good fit as far as they understood what I was trying to do. It was easier to explain because I already had the service sort of structured out in WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And so we could, and I got some good insight as to what I wanted based on beta testing it. So we were able to have some pretty smooth conversations about it. And they, they went through the whole process. I've learned a lot (laughs) about Mm -hmm. app development at this point. Um, You know, what a wireframe is, what uh, flow charts are and in user experience and all of those things. Um, but, you know, that's not my area of expertise and I don't try to let it be. I just want to be able to speak the same language. So I've learned, exactly. I've learned some of that's those things. That's my point that yeah. especially in digital pathology, you have people coming into the team from different backgrounds. And like yeah. the most extreme is the pathologist and the computer scientists. But you have... Uh, all kinds of different people, people who are in the lab, people who are uh, in the regulated environment, quality assurance, and they all have to speak their, the same language, but nobody is like aspiring to get anybody else's expertise because that's not the right. point. It's The point is to come together, speak yep. the same language, have a great product that is serving everybody's needs. So yeah, exactly. It comes into product creation, which I've also learned a ton about again, areas that I never as a veterinarian learned about as a pathologist, never learned about. Um, but I've had a lot of fun learning about because what I know that is that every bit that I learn, you know, again, I have to limit myself because I don't want to go. I want to let those teams, you know, do their expertise. But, uh, but every bit that I learn, I know that I can get closer to providing an experience for the customer, being the veterinarian, to, to enjoy using this service, to get the most out of it, to feel like they're actually, you know, doing something good for themselves and their patients. So that's what I want. And so talking with these teams has been really inspiring because, you know, they have all this, this you know, tech experience and they say, okay, you know, what is it that you envision? And I tell them, and then they they do that. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's really neat. Now it's not always smooth, you know, because they might come Did back you have with something some, like features or some visions that they said, uh, no way that's not happening. <laughs> no, not no, because anything's possible. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm actually in the process of, I've got a bigger vision happening right now that I actually am meeting with them. I told you after we talked to mm-hmm. kind of discuss and I thought, Oh, you know, maybe this isn't possible. Then I thought anything is possible. You know, it's just a matter of, uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that, right. And that you have to figure into your whole business plan, but, um, but no, not that there, there were some hiccups in the beginning and it wasn't on anybody's, uh, anybody's fault in particular, but, um, aligning those visions of things like what you aesthetically want it to look like. Uh, and that, you know, can be challenging because what one person finds to be aesthetically pleasing might not be what another person finds to be. So we had a little bit of a thing in the beginning where I was like, mm, I don't know, you know, and it's just about communication. Like the, mm-hmm. the app wasn't live yet. This was all just part of the design process. They were saying, what do you know, what do you think about this? And we were kind of like, I think we need to kind of reassess those design elements because this is not what I had in mind for design, mm-hmm. you know, colors, fonts, yeah. icons, stuff like that. Yeah. So um, design is yeah. one part. The other part that I, um, at some point when I was in the digital pathology company, company took part of was like the, um, user interface, like where yeah. all the buttons come, mm-hmm. what's most intuitive, where like, do they look first? So that was yeah. also an interesting thing. I guess uh, you had to develop yeah. this from scratch. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, they did, you know, we, okay. we worked together. So like, that's the thing at first I thought, um, I don't know anything about that stuff. And what I realized is that I don't have to, if I hire mm-hmm. a team that does, that's the whole point of hiring a team that does know how to, that has done these things before and can stand something up and say, what do you think about this? And then if you have any particular feelings about something, they can make adjustments, but I don't have to spend my time thinking, where's the button going to be, you know, because mm-hmm. as long as they understand my end goal, they can create something that at least is a good place to start that can be adjusted. Mm-hmm. I love that you basically 
did it before with the existing technology. Like you did it how you wanted to do with WhatsApp, with, you know, using the phone. And then it was basically translating what's already out there, uh, streamlining it and putting it into one tool. Yeah. You, you say you had a couple of tools, right, for reporting, whatever. So you, mm-hmm. that is cool. All in one place, yeah. I think it's so, it's great because it's basically doing digital pathology without any additional anything yeah (laughs) and i mean that's the goal like we just to be able to make things easier for people easy you know ease of use that's a big thing and cost effectiveness and that that's what i've found that is valuable about this service is that it kind of achieves both of those Mm -hmm. things um you know some and so some people may say well you don't have the whole slide to review. So how, you know, is that an issue, especially from the pathology standpoint, other pathologists may say, I don't feel comfortable. I remember distinctly, like I said, I don't, I didn't create telecytology, uh, like, you know, app static telecytology. There uh, actually are a couple of veterinary universities that offer that as a service. So you send in photos, Mm -hmm. but they do it Mm -hmm. through email. It's not through an app. And I remember when I first heard of that, I remember thinking, I don't think I'd be comfortable evaluating a slide through just like photos of certain areas. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, (laughs) it's here I am now, um, because I do realize the utility of it that you can diagnose uh, and you can at least get a lot of clues from from well-taken photos, um, having multiple objectives, multiple areas. And then we have the expertise as pathologists to know the limitations. You know, if I get Mm -hmm. one photo of, you know, uh, just a spindle cell and that's it, I know how to communicate to the veterinarian what that could be, that, that I'm really limited with that information. It's really no different than the limitations you get with a full slide review. You know, maybe, maybe you didn't hit the certain area that had the pathology in it. So it's just different. Exactly. Totally. And if you uh, also have a certain level of expertise at the point of care, um, Mm -hmm. that's kind of splitting your job into two because if it was a full slide you still have to find those areas Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then you have to find the answer here they find the areas you provide the answer so you know and that helps keep the cost exactly cost is lower thing the the whole thing is faster Uh, and the pathologists uh, sorry the veterinarians are learning from every case because they provided the images, then they get the answer. The next time, maybe if it's visible, they don't have to submit the case. Yeah. So yeah. phone is what we need. Microscope, obviously. The mm-hmm. app. I want to know if you had any hurdles uh, or technical difficulties when you were uh, developing the apps. What the app? What technical problems? Like specifically, tell me. What, yeah. were, what were the hurdles? <laughs> Well, we've intentionally grown slowly because what I did not want to happen was have, you know, this big, like me shouting from the rooftops about the app, putting, you know, time and energy into marketing it so that people know about it and then get a big run on cases right when we open the doors and then having a technical issue because I don't have that technical expertise Mm -hmm. that made me nervous. And I, I want that experience to be good and not the app crashed. But just like any, you know, so we, we did that intentionally and that was really good because we've had this user base um, that's started with us and have been um, almost like a second beta test where we've kind of mm-hmm. watched them go through the app and, and tried to pick up on any kind of issues that might arise. Um, and there haven't been a ton, but there have been some technical things just like any other technology. And I kind of had to get, I had to get used to that because I was like, is this like, is this because I don't have like, is there something happening at our end that this is not good? And then I realized this is just the growing pains of having a tech, mm-hmm. you know, being in the tech space. It's going to happen. Um, yeah, so it's, things- it's going to break and it's going to have bugs. <laughs> yeah, I had to learn I mean, that as well. I was <laughs> same, yes. same impression. And the beginning was like, why do you provide me a software that's uh, not perfect, that something right. crashes, something doesn't work? And then slowly I understood, okay, this is, it's not possible, it's so complex that it's not possible to foresee every yeah. kind of thing. That's why you're testing. And then exactly. when you release it, people are doing additional testing. So there's going to be something that's going to yep. crash anyway. So just yep. live with it and make it better the yeah. next time. 
Exactly. And I think being communicative with the people using it, letting them know, you know, we, are, this isn't, first of all, please tell us if something happens. Cause we can't know unless we know, unless you tell mm-hmm. us to apo- like sincere apologies, you know, like we recognize that your time is valuable. You may have put in, you know, your case. And so this didn't, this didn't uh, happen much, but a couple of times somebody would have put their case information in and then the app closed or um, it stalled or something. And that, you know, they are owed a sincere apology because they took the time out of their busy day to put that in and now they have to go back and do it again. That's, you know, a small thing, but it's not, you know, it's t- some of these times. So recognize, like acknowledging that that's a, that, that was a problem for them, apologizing and then fixing it. I mean, that's all you can do. You, you, there are going to be things that are going to happen, but you want to make sure that people understand that you care um, and that you're going to fix it. And so what's hard for me is I don't have a technical background, so I can't personally go in there and fix it. I have to communicate with my team and let them fix it. And luckily they've been super, super um, quick. I mean, that's the biggest thing is they're quick on fixing bugs and, and investigating things that have come up. But you asked for specifics, so that was one specific yes. Um, let's see. Oh, kind of one of the bigger ones that we had was, uh, we updated. (laughs) So again, I've learned all this stuff. I don't, I didn't even know what updating an app meant like six months ago, but we made some backend adjustments to, uh, nothing that the, that the vet or the user is going to see, but there were some backend adjustments to, um, some flow of things. Mm -hmm. And so they, the app team submitted an update to the app store everything was fine. But then uh, it actually caused an issue. Well, so we knew this was going to happen. The The user had to reset their password after okay. this app update. Mm-hmm. So it popped up and said, you know, because of a system upgrade, you have to reset your password. The problem is, is that um, the problem came up when they were putting their password or they were resetting their password or they clicked the link to reset password. We're all used to that, right? It goes to your email mm-hmm. and then you reset Yeah, you get an email and we were hitting some firewalls with the email servers. So the, some people were getting that email and some people weren't, and it wasn't a matter of it going to their spam folder. It was just, it was not arriving because of a firewall. So I had to get with my team and say, these, you know, this is a big problem because now they can't get into the app. This isn't just like a little annoyance. Like they, Mm -hmm. they can't get in. Um, So we really had to, buckle down and figure out how to fix that pretty quickly. And it didn't happen quickly. Um, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, and I shouldn't say quickly. I mean, it ha- we fixed it within the week, but that doesn't feel very fast when you like know people. Yeah. When you have a case that you want to submit. Yeah. Yeah. And so there was a lot of back and forth with a couple of clinics. They were very understanding. Um, and we eventually got them in and fixed the problem. But yeah, that was probably the one where I was really struggling the most where I was like, Oh, <laughs> technology, you know, but it's growing pains yeah so did you have uh, obviously you upload images did you have any problems with like too many images too big images or anything with the images i'm super interested in the image side of of this then we're gonna dive in what kind of images are you even accepting Uh, how do you teach that but let's start with the technical sure yeah so um we I wouldn't say problems with it. We had considerations, you know, when we were Mm -hmm. developing um, how many images are people going to be able to upload because all of this takes, uh, you know, space, uh, cloud space. The good thing about these images uh, is they're small, Mm -hmm. way smaller comparably to, you know, our digital scanner images. So that's another cost savings area there that this is a JPEG and not a, you know, a, 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 digital file that takes up a huge amount of space but you know if they're submitting we allow up to 20 uh photos to be submitted but um just because most people aren't going to submit more than that if they need to then they can at this point they can email me so it's a little clunky there that's another place where i want to kind of tweak things so that it doesn't feel like okay now i have to email outside of this app Um, but Mm -hmm. most people are not submitting more than 20 photos so uh, it works out for most people but um that was just kind of to limit the amount of space um that is taken up by each case but again it's usually more than sufficient to have 20 and um where do they send yeah to the server how is that set up i'm super interested in that as well (laughs) we might have to get my app team on here with me next time um (laughs) that i don't know i don't know where they are they um they 
are in a secure place. I should probably mm-hmm. know more specifics about that, but my app team, you know, that's their ex- area of expertise. So what I, what I care about is that they're, that they're secure. That there's no So you access security. them through the app as well. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, my screen looks very similar to what the user sees, but it's just a case, uh, a mm-hmm. case list. And so I will click, you know, the, the case. So, um, you know, it has like a pending list. And then if you submit a case, it immediately shows on my pending list. And when I click it, what comes up for me is exactly what you just entered in that form, mm-hmm. the case information, uh, the patient information. And then there's a, a box that has all the photos and I can click them and they open, they can open full screen. Um, I can zoom in on them as if they were a photo. So they're mm-hmm. not, um, they're not dynamically yeah. uh, zoomable. So there's no smartness as far as filling in pixelation and all of that. That's an, that's a goal for the future. Um, but right now it's literally just images. And uh, then my screen, I can click a button that says enter report. And then I get a, a, a form um, in the app. This is all in the app. And I enter my report and then I review it. And then I click uh, report finalized. Then what you see on your end, you get an alert on your phone that your report has been finalized. You go into the app. You can view the report directly in the app or you can download it as a PDF and it has all the information um, populated into that PDF so that I can easily go into the record. This is so cool. I love it. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, and so, um, okay, then if we ever get together with your app team, I want to know also, like, uh, how long do you keep those images and, you know, all this uh, digital pathology nerdy stuff that people are yeah. asking when they set up digital pathology. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and those are still some details that we're working out on the back end, because mm-hmm. like I said, it's, it's a learning curve for me. So those conversations are always ongoing. Um, and one thing you asked me that I didn't answer was how, how did we kind of train each other because we're both, yes, you yes, know, tell me about that. Yeah. They, I have learned as much as I possibly can to understand what we're talking about when we have our meetings. They're very good at communicating, um, what they mean without, you know, they're, they're programmers. Um, but they have, uh, their business is set up to be able to communicate what they're mm-hmm. doing to the, you know, lay person. Um, on the flip side of things, uh, you know, my, me explaining what I, what I do, you know, <laughs> take some challenges as you understand, like to yes. people who don't live in this world, but they didn't really need to know a lot of, of details there. I think with our test images and stuff that were coming through, they were kind of like, what's on the image, but it yeah, what is there, this? right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's a pretty intuitive process. I think they understand, um, you know, they understand what it is. I'm do- and definitely now after a couple of conversations. So it wasn't this big hurdle to really get past. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think for the um, development team, the information that they're interested in is your workflow and yep. the type of uh, files, the type of things you work uh, with and what you do with them. Where I yep. see this like pathology to computer vision translation is more image analysis side of things. Yep. So if you, mm-hmm. you know ever wanted to incorporate some kind of uh, blood dif- automated blood differential mm-hmm. or whatever, where you have to plug in image analysis, that's where you have to explain actually yes. what's on those images and how to identify those different cells. So yeah, that's um, a totally different process, mm-hmm. and that's something that I. I am starting to realize that I will, without giving away too much, like I will need to have those conversations and be a bit of a liaison between the programmers that don't have experience in Mm -hmm. the medical space. And it's hard because I'm trying to ask these questions like, you know, this is what I want to happen. Can you make that happen? Even though it's kind of specialized for medicine, it feels it's this, what I'm doing now is a very simple process from a programming Mm -hmm. standpoint. But, you know, what, what I have visions for to make it even better might take some more. <laughs> I think, honestly, um, getting a project manager. So if you're in the world of business, you've heard of mm-hmm. project managers oh, yes. before. They can really help uh, facilitate those conversations and kind of get everybody on the same page as far as speaking the same language. So that's something. Did I'm you have one for now. this project? Not for this. Not not yet, mm-hmm. but I'm looking into it. Yeah, I've actually contacted a couple to see if they can no, help. No, very but much. The more complex it gets, the more you need them. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, yeah. People and really just tapping into people's expertise is something that's been really helpful. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the uh, requirements for the images. So, okay, we take them with the phone, but they have to be diagnostic and they have to be a certain quality. Uh, What's needed and how do you convey this to the veterinarians or the people who are providing you the images? Yeah. So at this time, um, the way that we really give feedback about image quality is via the chat. So Mm -hmm. there's not at this point, and this is being developed, so that's why I say at this point, at this point, there's not much in the way of training to get images, though, because of the success of the service so far, and I realize that people are going to continue to use it, I really want to make that more accessible to people because they want to know, you know, they want to know those tips to help them get good images. So I do have a, a, I do have a sheet that's downloadable from the app. Um, It's a, a one sheet kind of tips and tricks showing diagnostic areas of a slide, showing um, overstained versus understained areas, giving tips on how to get good images, explaining that we really like to have um, 10x, 40x, and 100x views, not just all 100x, because these are things that veterinarians oftentimes just don't know. And it's not because they're dumb. It's not anything that has to do with them. It's just not it's just part they of haven't their been training. training before. Right? You know, I, I do provide some training in the sense of a, they have a downloadable sheet, but my plan is to make it even um, better, really make something a little bit more user-friendly, something that I know that they're going to review. Um, because even though they may not feel comfortable with taking photos, again, I'm able to help them in the chat. So if I, if I get a really blurry photo and that's all I have, I don't have other diagnostic photos, I can chat and say, hey, this one's pretty blurry. Um, can you go in and take a couple more? Or I need at least five more or whatever, and I can give that guidance. That just creates a lot of, uh, you know, that's manual. So anything that can make things faster Mm -hmm. on both of our ends would be really helpful and kind of training them from the beginning. And it doesn't take a lot of training, but just a little guidance on what do we need? What do we like to see? What can help create really diagnostic photos? Um, You know, that's, that's good information for them to have. So I really like to have at least five photos, Um, really more Mm -hmm. the better with this type of service. Um, but sometimes vets think, oh, I don't want to give her too many because I don't want her to have to look at too many. But so communication, you know, it's like, yes, I want to see a lot because you increase the likelihood that we're going to have a diagnostic case or at least some helpful information, if not straight up diagnostic, if we have a lot of photos. And there's actually a paper that was recently in the past, I think five years, um, published in veterinary clinical pathology that looked at that and, uh, looked at, um, the utility of, of static telepath or uh, static telecytology. And um, they found that submission of at least five or more photos um, increased the accuracy of diagnosis. So there's data to support that. And I would agree with that. Usually five or more is a good amount of photos. To we can link to this paper in the description yeah. as well. So yeah. feel free to send it to me and I'm going to put it in the description. Uh, yeah, for well. those who need some scientific proof that this is a legitimate technology, <laughs> we're not mm-hmm. inventing yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. And human, human medicine too, they call it rapid on-site um, evaluation rows. Um, yeah. So mm-hmm. that's a, something they've been doing for years in the human medical world. And um, there have been papers written in, uh, in this area as well. A lot of looking at uh, providing cytology services to um, third world countries or uh, countries that don't have those resources available to them, and so there's been a, there's been some there's been some research there, and um, I think there you know there are parts of that re- that really extrapolate to veterinary medicine because of um, the financial the financial limitations um, that we have to deal with because we don't have that. Uh, I don't want to say benefit of insurance because yeah. <laughs> at least in the U S it's not the most uh, fun thing to deal with. And it's not always super ben- beneficial, but it's um, it takes, you know, it's just a different process as we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. I think that static images are kind of not so showcased uh, because now with the um, hype of uh, scanners of super high resolution whole slide images and also the uh, artificial intelligence and image analysis on top of those slides uh, the fact that you can actually just do it with your phone and have 
a consultation with the tools that you have uh, is not really advertised so much, which I think is a pity because basically this is the entrance for digital pathology to everyone who, yeah. who you know, would benefit from this, be it uh, MD pathologists, veterinary pathologists, veterinary non-pathologists, veterinarians, uh, people from remote areas. Everybody has a smartphone. If you have a microscope and you're using it for something, uh, take images and consult. But I think it's been downplayed in the era of personalized medicine and AI giving you insights that you were not Mm -hmm. able to see in the slide, which is a fantastic technology. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot before that. This is like the very advanced thing. But you can start small uh, right now. With your microscope. Yeah, and, your and that's absolutely right. I mean, and the thing is, is that, yes, this is not the sexy technology. The digital scanners are. AI is. And there is a place for that. And it is a, that I mean, we got to keep moving technology forward. And I, like I said, I, I work with these companies to read whole slide images. Like, I, I believe in the power of those um, advanced diagnostics. It doesn't change the fact that it's No, it doesn't it's change the gap that's before, gap. right? The yes. advanced technology addresses something else than mm-hmm. what we're doing here. Right. Yeah. I feel very strongly about that because they're forgotten. Like the people that live, you know, have a one or two doctor practice that work in, uh, you know, a rural area, they are not going to have the ability to have a scanner in their clinic. for the Never, most ever I will mean, they. they. Yeah. yeah. Nor will they have a need for that. No, no. No. And the business, you know, unless these scanners are free, which they're not ever going to be, um, even if they were, I mean, honestly, money aside, if you just don't do a ton of cytology, but you still need the need, you still have the need for a pathologist's opinion because you want to provide, you know, top quality medicine and you want that help. You don't want to feel uncomfortable when you're looking through your microscope and having no idea what you're looking at. You know, you, you are, going to be in a position where you having a a scanner in your practice is not only going to be cost prohibitive, but you may not feel comfortable with it because even though a lot of them are pretty intuitive, there are troubleshooting issues. And, you know, I talk to a lot of veterinarians and I hear them and they say, I don't, I don't want to mess around with slide trays. I don't want to mess around with like having to, you know, troubleshoot and spend 30 minutes of my day trying to figure out like why my slide isn't scanning in well. That's not same, a knock on the same digital Same story companies. at larger institutions, uh, mm-hmm. you know, even yeah. high throughput scanners. You have more hardware to deal with. And here, yep. here's your phone. The only thing Everybody that knows you need how to, to know phone. how to take good pictures, which right. I actually have a little guide for how to take uh, good pictures, um, not really on the diagnostic side, but more for... Um, educational and you know posters and conferences so i'm gonna link to that uh, yeah i'd love to see it in the description as well and whenever you have your guide let me know and we can put it there as well great i will i will okay so if you were starting this project again right now what would you do differently it really makes you evaluate what you've done (laughs) um or is there something that you would not do uh, at all because it was a waste of time, didn't need to do it, had to scrap it? Something that like lesson learned that if somebody wants to do that or if you are doing it again or for your next yeah. uh, level project, what would that be? Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, I've been really happy with the way things have progressed. So there's nothing really huge that I think that definitely was it. That doesn't mean that things haven't happened. Um, I think Partly, I'm, a, I'm pretty much an eternal optimist. So anytime something happens, I just kind of deal with it and then move on. So it's hard for me to remember paid full time. Well, one thing that I was, uh, this is not necessarily a bad thing, but I was very cautious in the beginning because I do have a, a, um, a large, you know, Facebook group. I have a lot of people that I have a direct, you know, megaphone essentially to because they follow me on social media and mm-hmm. I provide those educational things for them. I was um, reluctant. We're going to link to that as well. Of course. Yes. I was reluctant to talk too much about this service initially because I worried, um, this sounds cocky and it's not at all. I I was worried about too much business just because of my own life. You know, my own, um, I wanted to make sure that as the sole pathologist, I didn't get overrun with cases until I was ready and until I knew that I would have other pathologists that could help and, you know, either be contractors or even 
employees at some point. So I was pretty hesitant to really talk about it on social media. And so that slowed growth. And it's not all about growth. It, honestly, it's about letting people know that this exists. So they have this mm -hmm. resource. From the business standpoint, of course, you want things to grow. You're spending, I mean, this is my full-time job. Like I support myself with this business. So I, uh, of course, want it to be, you know, successful and I want people and and it's just, it's heartwarming for me to know that something that I'm so passionate about and that can support me as, a, as my job is also just so helpful for veterinarians. I mean, that's just the win, win, win. Um, mm -hmm. But I was hesitant to talk much about it because I didn't want to get overrun with cases. And so it was slower to grow because, you know, it did, it, if you're not talking about it, people don't know about it. Um, the, yeah, exactly. the cool thing has been is that the people that do know about it, there's been a nice word of mouth. Um, you know, VetMed is, is very tight knit and there are little sub communities like the mobile veterinarians, you know, they talk about yeah, the service and like their Facebook groups. For them. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. So I guess if I had to do it again, I would maybe be a little less reluctant to talk about it in the beginning, mm -hmm. but we're still at the beginning. I mean, we've only had this available through the app for a couple of months. So I don't worry. Once I think you're ready, uh, I'm yeah. like... I think it's fantastic. I'm going to be spreading the word. So you just give me green hey. light. This is going to go out to the internet. Uh, yeah. But um, no, I I'm just ready. think I'm it's... ready for it. I mean, people, I want them to submit their cases. Very and good. I have a plan now to like, if I do get overwhelmed personally, then you I have a plan scale. for how to. Yeah. And it's not just grab any pathologist. Like the pathologist that, um, you know, would work with me, I would, they would need to understand the, the mission behind this and uh have the same communication you know kind like we have we have company pillars we have company things that are important to us and uh kind and effective and like just communication is really important mm -hmm. and I, opening that channel of communication between the practitioner and the better or uh, the practitioner and the pathologist is a big is a big part of this too so Yeah, which is like a non-existent thing. You get the report from a reference lab and here you go, do whatever you yeah. want with it <laughs> or not. Yeah. yeah, and there's value in that. It's just not, it's just, there's there can be breakdown in communication. I mean, you know how it is. The practitioner mm -hmm. may not understand what the report means and then they have to call and their call may not go through or you're, you know, you, you deserve as a pathologist time off. So you may not be in the office, mm -hmm. you know, and then maybe you get back to them on Monday and that's totally acceptable, but there's just a breakdown in, in that continuity of communication that um, technology can help us with. I love your app because it gives, it lets people start with digital pathology with what they have. Uh, digital yep. pathology, sometimes this word is intimidating. It means that, oh, you have to have ton of expensive gear and ton of experience. Right. Otherwise, you cannot get into digital pathology. You can right now, like use this phone or another one with your microscope. And in the podcast, we talked that, you know, okay, you don't even have to do diagnostics. You can do education. You can do sharing what you see under the microscope. This is all digital pathology. So, you know, I'm all about digital pathology for everyone. So thanks for coming up with this idea. Thanks for seeing the need. Thanks for, you know, stepping up, even though this is outside of our education. Uh, it's something we think is valuable and want to take it to the next level and bring it to more people. Thanks so much, yes. Kate. Uh, well, I appreciate your support. I mean, especially having other pathologists support and just seeing, you know, that yes, it's, it's, it, it serves its purpose for the need that it's meant for. And yeah, just having support is everything. So I, I appreciate, you know, your ongoing friendship and support and uh, having me back. I mean, I always love talking about, about this. Totally, stuff, yeah. so. I'm going to have you back once you come up with this image analysis thing. Oh, then you, maybe we invite the team as well, because I'm going to be asking many of many technical questions. Yeah, I have some good ideas. So hopefully, you know, we're going to keep moving things forward because, uh, you know, I don't want to stop with just like a good, a good service This is a very good service, but always thinking, how can we make it better and staying within the, um, and when I say make it better, it's staying within the, the low cost kind of, um, mm -hmm. realm, you know, we don't, we don't want to strive for bigger and better if it's going to cause things to get 
excessively expensive. That's not what we're trying to create. So we're trying to be very creative and um, yeah, more to come. <laughs> Great. And I'm going to link to everything below, like everything that Kate has to offer. She has plenty of stuff for cytology, for education in that realm uh, and to our previous episodes. So have a look and uh, talk to you next time. Okay. Thanks everybody. And thank you for having me, Alex. Thanks so much for listening. If you are still here at the end of this episode, one of three things happened. Either it was super valuable, so very nice, or you like me or you like Kate. So uh, for any of those reasons, we are very, very grateful. Thanks a lot for sticking so long and feel free to watch another video or uh, listen to the other podcast episode with Kate. Thank <laughs> you.